All right, we're here today, um, back on the Gravity Podcast with my friend Nick Nanton. Nick, thanks for joining me. Uh, great to be here, man. Excited to uh, get into the conversation. Yeah, yeah, good. So, um, yeah, it's fun. You know, we know each other through Strategic Coach, and you know, have have talked, uh, you know, kind of offline. But you know, this is fun to kind of go deep with you and and really get to know your full journey. So, why don't we start at the beginning? Why don't you tell me a little bit about kind of childhood, your family, you know, early family dynamics, where you're from, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, man. And and what I, I love this question, we'll probably go deeper into some frameworks that I've been building around um, what I think really makes a person of impact and significance. But, you know, I, I always ask my clients, uh, you know, when you are getting in, when you're doing business with someone, do you share your story from time to time or is it choreographed into every phase of your business? And it's really interesting how few people have their story choreographed in their business. And even I could do a better job. Uh, but mm-hmm. I, I, I think your story is the one thing, the only thing in the world that sets you apart from everybody else. Anything else mm-hmm. can be, can be duplicated, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and I'm I'm a big branding guy, right? So, and I just say your brand is simply your story. Branding is just storytelling. A great brand is a story that other people want to tell for you. Uh, mm-hmm. So, anyway, and then even I love this question. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I'm from Barbados, uh, the island of Barbados. My family's been there for 300 years. Uh, we went there as Welsh pirates in the 1600s. Um, my dad's from an even smaller island called Saint Vincent. Uh, my parents and my aunts and uncles and grandparents, a, a, a slew of us, uh, moved to the Orlando, Florida area in uh, the at the end of 1980. I was about 10 months old and they moved here because the islands are a beautiful place to visit, but uh, they wanted more opportunity for all of the children. Um, My dad opened a furniture store in Orlando and my uncles opened an electronics store right next to it. And so... Here we were in America. My parents knew really nothing about the American systems and they were uh, just trying to figure it out. I was almost one. My brother was almost three. Uh, I have one older brother. And so, um, you know, we, we did the immigrant thing, right? I mean, they, they, we, thankfully, English was our first language. We didn't have that struggle. Um, but we, you know, family was super important. Lots of big family get togethers. We all lived within, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes of each other in the Orlando area. And we always had a, a dinner at my grandparents' house once a week. And there were other, sometimes twice a week. So grew up with a big family of, of aunts, uncles, and cousins. Um, and then my dad and my uncles got the opportunity through a relationship uh, in in the islands. Uh, a gentleman who now owns, I believe, all of Shell Oil in the Caribbean. Um, he offered my, my dad and my uncles the opportunity to, to have the first Suzuki Jeep franchise here in Orlando. Mm-hmm. And I believe that was like 1986-ish. Um, mm-hmm. And they had it for a couple of years. And, and what I remember, what's important to me is um, I, I had a childhood where I really didn't go without. I mean, you know, it, mm-hmm. we weren't spoiled, but people were always coming and visiting and bringing money and staying with us. And like, I, I had, you know, plenty of toys and clothes. And we lived in a, a modest house, I'd say, probably 1,800 square feet, maybe something like that. Um, but we had a nice, uh, you know, we had nice, uh, nice living. Um, and then my dad got in the Suzuki dealership. And when I was like, eight years old-ish. They tell me now he was worth like a million dollars on paper. So that's like in 1988, it's a lot of money. But then by like 1989, they were fighting bankruptcy. So essentially, Mm. like everything that I remember of my childhood was um, financial struggle. Um, My Mm. parents were struggling to... um, they had, they, we moved in 87 when things were good. My parents built their dream house, uh, 2,400 square feet, uh, with a tennis court next to it because my dad had to walk uphill both ways. We've all heard the stories just to get to a tennis court. So he built his own little <laughs> paradise. And, uh, you know, but for me, from that, from like, I went from not, really not going without, like I'd say, to when sort of the clothes I wanted to wear started to matter and the shoes started to matter. And like, all of a sudden, there was sort of this, like, eh, we can't really do that. Um, and, and I do remember, whether it was spoken or unspoken, my parents, I always say we had more love than we could spend. My brother and I just completely loved. My parents still live like 50 minutes away. They help out a ton with the kids, come to every game, every dance competition. They're, they're amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And when I'm out of town, they help. We had more love than we could spend, but money was just scarce. And so mm-hmm. it was sort of like, hey, we're trying to keep everything together here. <laughs> um, you can do anything you want in life. We just can't pay for it. And so... Mm-hmm. I started my entrepreneurial career pretty early. By that time, we we had the tennis court. So like by nine or 10, I was teaching tennis lessons because I figured out if I could get like five kids at 10 bucks for a half hour, I could make 50 bucks in a half hour. Like I started mm-hmm. figuring out those things, started mowing lawns, started doing all that stuff um, and just started learning how 
to make money, learning that if I provided value to someone else, um, I would get value in return. So, Nick, let and, me just hop in there for a please. second. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's really fascinating, and I love that kind of background. Uh, you know, even you know, going back kind of generationally, right? There's some threads there that are that are interesting. But I'm just curious, you know, at, at that young age, you know, you say nine or ten, when you kind of realize you need to start to, you know, maybe put some money in your own pocket if if you wanted it. Um, do you remember uh, at all, you know, kind of what it was like? to be a kid and to have that kind of scarcity around money. Um, you know, what, what was it like to kind of go from that, having all the toys and the things that, you know, were starting to matter to you to not, and, and, and then kind of like, tell me more about the love part, you know, kind of how they also at the same time were really, you know, what I would imagine, you know, going through bankruptcy and, you know, there, there's some scary hard times for them as adults, you know, right. yet you're describing them as really loving parents. You know, tell me a little bit about kind of what all of that was like for you as a kid, if you can remember it. Yeah. So, I mean, I do remember they, they narrowly dodged bankruptcy, but it was like a sort of like an eight or 10 year ordeal with trying to sell the building, sort of help bail them out. And they end up trying to open another dealership in Gainesville, but that, you know, where University of Florida is where I went to college, but I was younger than that. But it just, the town wasn't quite ready. It was a Mitsubishi dealership. But so, yeah, um, I, I remember number one, we lived in a pretty affluent area, like a nice suburb. Uh, we lived, you know, they'd custom built the home. So it's nice, you know, um, I, I'd say modest. I mean, 24. 400 square foot home isn't modest, but it's certainly, you know, being worth that kind of money back then. It wasn't like they went out and like, you know, bought a mm -hmm. mansion. Um, and so, yeah, I remember, I just remember scarcity. I mean, I remember certain times where like, um, and my brother and I, my brother's two years older, we were growing at that time, right? Like, I mean, I got a 16 year old and a 13 year old boy and a 10 year old, a nine year old daughter right now. And my boys just eat and eat and eat. So like we, I, I know what it's like, but we were, I remember there were times my mom would give me some of her food. Like, cause we, mm -hmm. it wasn't that we were eating pork and beans, but like, it just, we just didn't, I just scarcity is is exactly the way I remember. Like everything mm -hmm. was scarce. Um, other kids could be mean, you know. Like if I got if, if I got shoes that like we could afford, and it's like, oh, those aren't the new Air Jordans, or though you don't have at the mm -hmm. time the Billabong jacket, or you know what I mean. Like mm -hmm. all those things. I think the thing about being a kid that's so interesting when I look back at it. A couple of things. Number one, you don't realize that your parents were growing up with you. I think it's like mm -hmm. a really important point. Like because mm, now that great. yeah, now that I'm a parent, like I. I'm growing up with my kids. Like we're growing up totally. together. It's it's, yeah. it's it's that. And and number two, um, the things that make you stand out as a kid are ultimately what make you really successful in the world if you can learn to embrace them. And I think there's some really yeah. pivotal moments in all of our lives where I think certainly most kids, certainly like in middle school and even high school, like try to blend in. Like, I just don't want to be called out. I just don't want to be put in front of the class. I just don't, you know, whatever. And so we try to be we try to be the same as everybody else. So at these times when like I lived in a pretty good suburb and everyone else had these, like there were just things I just remember not having. Now, mm -hmm. again, um, was it dire straits? No. And I think, you know, the way we process our life is really important. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, but it's just what I processed. I processed that I couldn't, I couldn't have some of the things that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I, and I just remember there's a turning point, like, well, it wasn't that I couldn't have them, just my parents couldn't give them to me. So I very early in life, a lot of kids find it out after college or whenever, figure out like, oh, this, if I want to do something, I have to find my own way. Um, mm -hmm. Along with that, my parents were just, I mean, super supportive. I played very competitive tennis. I was playing tennis in the state of Florida, um, ranked in the probably top 50-ish by the time I was in the 16s. 18s, mm -hmm. I, I broke the top 100, starting to get scholarship offers and that sort of thing. And I remember like, so talk about love. Like I played at this place where it was, for I lived in Lake Mary, Florida and my parents still live in that same house. Uh, and there was this tennis training academy where they had at one point well, during my career, they had the number one number one player in the nation, the men's 18s or boys 18s, boys 16s, the number one girl in like 16s and 14s. And we had like, 10 players there that had come from across the country that were top 10 in the country going all the mm -hmm. way up and playing junior Wimbledon, just open all this stuff. But oh, I could not afford, my parents couldn't afford me to play there. Mm -hmm. So we did maintenance for the club. So that was, so I remember my parents one day digging, I think we redug sprinkler ditches. Like mm -hmm. and my, my parents, you know, my parents are grown ass people out mm -hmm. there with me 
you know, digging ditches. You know, my dad at the time um, was working for a manufacturer for pool table and spa company. Things were starting to, you know, get a little better. Um, but it was just like, man, it was, it, they would just, they did whatever we needed. They were there. And so I, I just would say that I think, um, you know, there was no conversation that was off limits. Um, they, they, it was very open for communication. Uh, and they, and they wanted to, they wanted to nurture us and help us, you know, back to the whole beginning. They wanted us to have an opportunity they didn't have. And mm-hmm. so they tried to give us every, they tried to set us up to have an opportunity. And what they always said, um, my dad went to, to McGill in Canada, which, you know, is a very good school. It's like mm-hmm. a top mm-hmm. five school. It's like a Harvard, Yale. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's a very bright guy. Um, and he got accepted to do his master's, but ended up moving back uh, to the islands and, you know, getting married to my mom and everything. And I think he always regretted it because I think he, I think there's this, this fallacy in his mind that if he'd have had that master's, he, things would have gone differently for whatever mm-hmm. reason. It's like, like, sort of like I would imagine someone who didn't graduate college would be like, man, mm-hmm. if I just had that diploma. So I think there was sort of a false sense of loss there for him. But what was drilled into my brother in my head from the time we were little was like, my brother was an actor and a playwright. I was, I'm a musician, um, still am, thankfully. And it was just like, hey, you can do whatever you want in life. Just get a profession. Just get a profession mm-hmm. for backup. We're both like, no, we're not doing that. And then my mm-hmm. brother goes to med school and ruins it for both of us. <laughs> So, so I'm not going to get a med. So I go to law school. So I, I didn't end up going to law school and, you know, I'm a member of the bar and all that fun stuff. But that was like, education was like drilled into us. Like you were uh-huh. going to do well and all that. Yeah. So it's interesting because um, that's like a, that's like a definite conditioning that, you know, clearly you and your brother both did get ingrained in you and, and, and kind of went and got those professional uh, credentials, right? Um, but but kind of backing up, uh, I, I, you know, what sounds like to me is when people are struggling, uh, one of two things really happens. You know, they they either stay in the struggle and they let the struggle really end up shaping their lives um, for for and becoming like their state that they stay in, um, suffering, struggle, etc. Or they move through it. And and your parents seem like they were kind of constantly moving through it, doing whatever it took to work hard and to provide for their kids and try to create the life for you and your brother and for themselves that they that you all wanted. And you got to see that and decided to be a part of that, that you were going to try to be a part of solving this problem for yourself as well. And, and what I'm curious about kind of coming back to the love piece is you called it support. Um, it seems to me like they gave you a, enough kind of confidence, love, support to know at a young age that you could go do this for yourself, however that had to be, however you could. Um, where, you know, I think a lot of kids would just like tell themselves stories that they weren't worthy, they weren't enough. How important was it for you to get that kind of love? Or do you think that like part of it is just who you are to go out and hustle and make it happen? Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I definitely am, uh, I have a, I can have a stubborn streak when I want to. <laughs> and so, uh, or I sort of born that way. So I, I really, I've, I don't know at what point I realized that, you know, challenges were meant to be lived up to. Uh, and so that was just a challenge. But I would, I guess I would say, I think the best way I could answer that is the way I tell people now, because people say, man, you do all these crazy things and how do you accomplish all this stuff? And I would, I would, I think my answer here, I've never really paralleled it back to my youth, but you know, I have three kids and a wife of almost 19 years who are the world to me and they really don't care what awards I win, what I do in the world. They never even know where I, when I, like I just got back from a shoot last night. They don't even ever, my wife typically doesn't even know where I am. She's like, where are you again? Someone's asking. But like, mm-hmm. I, and, and, but I always tell people like, they just don't care. I mean, they're, they're, they're happy for me. They've come to awards. If it's fun. But they're like, if I fail miserably at something, the worst place I have to go is like, I've got this floor right here that like, they're going to love me. They're not going to care. I'm going to be the same dad and husband that I was before I failed miserably. You know, as long as I don't let them down in something or did something like infidelity or any of those things, right? Which um, which I'm not going to do. But, you know, but as far as like business risk and stuff, it's like, it's not a big deal. So I think with, I think the security I got from my parents was like, hey, try things. You're going to fail. You know, 
do it. Like, let's just try it. And I, and, and I think because of that, I, I would bet that my parents took off some of the guardrails earlier than most people would, you know? So, um, like for instance, like I got a 16 year old, he wouldn't know how to mow a lawn if it hit him in the face, you know, but like I was out mowing lawns and refilling the gas and edging like it, I don't know. I don't remember, but I'm guessing around 11 or 12, you know, it's like I was, I had a, my parents did have a ride on mower and I'd like drag equipment behind me. And, you know, it's like sort of like an episode of Little Rascals in my head in a way, but it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, so I, but I think it was always like, Hey, yeah, let's, let's, let's find a way. I think my, my dad particular is always like, Hey, if, if, if there's something you really want, let's, let's find a way. And he always taught me how to sort of break things down. Like, you know, you, if you want to get to a million dollars, you know, he didn't, talk about it this way, but you know, that's a million people giving $1 or, you know, a mm-hmm. uh, hundred thousand people giving you $10 or, you know, but I, I think mm-hmm. he, I, I think he didn't teach it to me. Maybe I don't remember being intentional, but I think I learned that from, from both of them. And now when I look at some of the big projects I do, people are like, man, how do you, I'm like, man, just break it all down into a bunch of little pieces. It's, it's pretty mm-hmm. simple when you break things right. down. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, all of that's really important learning as a kid, even if you're wired to kind of hustle and to work and to um, be courageous, you know, to, to see your parents fail um, and to have them uh, really tell you it's okay. And, and, you know, keep trying, keep swinging to see them do that, you know, pretty impactful, I think, for a young kid to see. There's some safety, as you described, that's there that, you know, most people... Uh, a lot of people, you know, we we end up in a in a circle of entrepreneurs that right. you know people are um, taking risk, and it seems you know normal. But you know, when you think about kind of the world at large, you know, most people aren't um, programmed to do that. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think a really important thing you just said is you know, I, like I have a friend who's really great athlete doing Ironmans and stuff, and I posted one time like, man, I just you know, I just want my kid to to keep thinking of me as Superman. I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, I think it's super important for your kids to be able to see you fail and Mm. what you do when everything doesn't go right. Because again, Mm. I hadn't really thought about it until you mentioned it that way. But I have thought about like, yeah, how do you, how do you show your kids character? Like if you, if all you do is win, like there's not a lot of great, there's not a lot of great uh, lessons in that typically. So, um, Anyway, yeah, I think that's the yeah. important thing. Yeah, I, I I think it's really important. And somebody once told me because you know when, when my kids were little, I, I don't feel like I was the parent that I am today. I think I kind of you know matured, like you said. You know, I was growing with my kids, and um, I, I think I'm a much better father today than than I was when they were little. And I think you know somebody once told me the fact that they can see you change is more important than had you done it right from the beginning. Um, that, that whatever you didn't do perfectly, the fact that they now see you doing it better and that you made a change is really way more impactful than you know anything else. Um, okay, so tell me a little bit about... Uh, I, I want to talk tennis with you because uh, I also grew up a tennis player. I love the sport. I still play it. I um, am around a friend of mine who was a professional player and now is managing and training professional players. He's a facility here in Columbus. You'll have to come and uh, visit when when you're in town next. You'd love it. Um, and we're we're doing a little bit of work together trying to kind of figure out how to holistically support these players. Um, to not just succeed on the court, but in life. Tell me a little bit about tennis. Um, it sounds like it was an important part of your childhood. You know, tell me uh, about kind of what you learned, you know, what the experience was like, you know, in hindsight, you know, what impact did that sport have on your life? Yeah. So I, and, and again, some of my ages before are a little fuzzy, but this will, so what I said, the age group on some of the things before may not be 1000% accurate because I'm trying to remember. But I do remember I started playing tennis competitively at 12. So it was probably 13, 14 when we were digging ditches and all that fun stuff uh, at the tennis course. But uh, yeah, I, I was, you know, I'd play two hours a day, essentially five days a week. And then as I got up in the older age back, it's sometimes three or four hours a day. And then in summers, it could be, you know, all day. Um, and yeah, I was a lefty. So I had an advantage there, still do. Um, mm. I had a coach who 
I had multiple coaches over the years, but my sort of last coach in through high school and the one I decided not to play in college because I had I could go to better academic schools not playing tennis than I could go playing tennis and it was gonna be super expensive if I went on to play. And my parents were like, Are you gonna play pro tennis? I was like, I don't think so. They're like, yeah, we both know that. So why would you get <laughs> run up a bunch of debt to play mm-hmm. at a D three school or whatever when you got a full ride to Florida, you just mm-hmm. aren't good enough to play tennis. So I was like, Yeah, you're right. And so mm-hmm. um yeah, I played a lot. I learned a ton of a ton. I mean, one thing I will just never forget, I used to play, like I said, we had a court at our house. And so my dad would play doubles. So as I got older, I'd start playing, mixing with the guys in the evening. It took me probably took me until I was like 15 maybe to beat my dad like maybe 16 mm-hmm. like it was that was like a big thing and my son keeps trying to beat me but it's not gonna happen uh <laughs> and so uh so but i just started i remember there's one guy we used to play with and we could be down me and him would be playing as an older gentleman named floyd and i remember mm-hmm. mr floyd we could be down like five love second set and he'd be like hey nick you know how you win tennis i'm like yeah. he's like one point at a time. Let's go. And so I like mm-hmm. really learned, like I've, I've had, I had some amazing comebacks in tennis because I really learned to compartmentalize and go. I mean, sometimes I was a total train wreck. I mean, that's how you learn mm-hmm. in sports, especially mm-hmm. when it's totally relying on you. Um, mm-hmm. I just learned like, okay, all right, this is all doable one point at a time. It's such a mental game. Uh, mm-hmm. By the time you get to that level of tennis, I mean, there's some freaks of nature and I'm not particularly tall. I'm like five, eight and I was probably even a little shorter then. But mm-hmm. other than that, like everyone's athleticism is pretty good. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's how hard are you working? What's your mental game? Like, so mm-hmm. I think tennis taught me a ton about mental game. I do remember, and I have apologized to Tony Robbins personally since, but my tennis coach gave me a, a pirate instead of Tony Robbins CDs at like 16. And, uh, <laughs> I remember, listening to it. And like, I, I believe that was like a huge shift in my mind. Just, just hearing like how possible Tony made things feel and how yeah. much, um, and how much like you are, you know, sort of the, you are responsible for your own outcomes. You are. So then that, that helped me a ton with my mental game. Um, I, my nastiest, I have a, I have a pretty big lefty forehand, but like my nastiest stroke that you'll understand is I have a, I have a kick serve and uh-huh. it's, um, there's a story, the best way I could articulate is the story of this guy who in Australia, I saw it a couple of years ago on, on Facebook, guys trying to learn how to ride a bike. When you turn, turn the handlebars, right, the, the, the tire goes left. And when you turn the left, so it's opposite of what you've done your whole life. Took him like, I think a year to learn how to ride this bike correctly. His mm-hmm. his son was like five and learned how to ride in like a week, but his mm-hmm. brain plasticity was just less. Well, Mike's kick serve, if you have a righty kick serve, it bounces the opposite way. Well, just like that bike, you knew my kick serve was going to bounce the other way, but your body mm-hmm. just couldn't just couldn't mm-hmm. figure it out. So yeah. that was a big advantage that I had doing that. So that probably got me further than I would have gotten. Um, but then, you know, injury and all the other fun stuff. Uh, but yeah, I, I just remember Florida Sun. I'm in Florida. I learned to not care about the heat. Played July at noon on a 110 degree court. And I, I just learned a ton about mental toughness. I'd say it's probably what I learned the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. It's it's a kind of a funny thing how it it kind of comes and goes. It's it's come back into my life as an adult. And I'm I'm the dad that's out there, you know, playing on Sundays. My kids don't play, but, um, you know, they've kind of watched me do that with my friends every Sunday. And it's still kind of a really fun part of life. And actually now as an adult, I find myself learning a lot about life through my learning about my tennis game, you yep. know, I'm, I'm out there trying to get better because I just love the 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 growth aspect of it. You know, I yeah. like to get good at something and to get better at something. And, um, and, uh, and I'm seeing, you know, kind of like how to let go of my inhibitions and to, you know, lean in and to step in and to be courageous yep. and to be yep. free. And I'm like, I need to do all of that more in life too, you know? Yep. And learning so how it's to funny. lose. Like separating yeah. your identity from winning and losing. Like, I think that's a big thing for kids. Like mm-hmm. you can lose a game and still and and admire how well the other person played. It's not always like, oh, I played terrible today. It's like, right. learn how to lose. Like there's always going to be somebody better than you in life. Even if you were to get to number one in the world in anything, it's a short window. So like, just, yeah. you got to learn to lose. And I think that's, yeah. that's a big lesson. A lot of parents... As sports today, I think are just crazy the way parents have sort of ruined it. You know, I mean, I tell yeah. all my kids, you're not not going pro, you're not going to college on it. Have fun, like play as many sports as you can because yeah, this is sort of your time in in grade school, right up through high school, and then it's sort of over. I mean, you can yeah. have you can have you know uh, recreational games, you can do other things like that, but you know, it's like 
like what a great experience to be in a team with friends, learning to win, learning to lose. And I just think it's it's so good, so good for kids. Yeah, my my friend actually and I were talking this morning. The one that trains these uh, players, and he had a player that was um, uh, qualifying uh, this week at the French Open nice. and uh, lost, and he was really down. Um, and just saying how he practices one way and plays another way, and um, you know, there's uh, I think a lack of a commitment to really kind of be willing to lose and just play the game. And my my friend was putting it in perspective. He said, you know, look, you're 22 years old. Uh, your grandfather's, you know, 85. Your other one's 97. You're, you're probably going to live to be 90 years old, you know, yeah. just based on the way things are going. So you've got about 70 years to figure out like what you're going to do with your life. Why don't you just take the next four and go all in on playing your game, you know? And it's kind of a Beautiful. funny way to look at it when you're, you know, thinking about the long game, you know? That's one of the hardest things I think to think about in life in general, like to zoom out, right? I mean, you know, we, we obviously know Dan Sullivan very well. It's sort of the, the also relates to that gap in the gain concept. Yeah. Like, we're, like seeing where you've come from, like where, but like, yeah, it's, it's so weird. I mean, I'll even say like, I've got a bunch of my documentaries on Amazon and like you, the human brain is wired to respond to negativity. And like, I try to mm-hmm. keep news out of my life. I try to, but I'll catch myself every now and then like, huh, I wonder, like I have one film and there's like 1,350 reviews or something like that, which is insane. Cause no one leaves a review for anything on Amazon. Like I don't, mm-hmm. I can't be mad about it. I don't, mm-hmm. but like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'll scroll through and I'll see all these five. It's got like 4.9, five stars or but I'll like scroll through the latest reviews and I'll only stop in like the person that's totally destroying it. And I, yeah. and like, it makes me clam up. I'm like, like, why don't I even look at that? But like, you know, we, yeah. we have this thing, like it's whatever's going wrong in, in the moment is, is catastrophe. Like yeah, no, yeah. no way can life be any worse? I mean, you know, it's, it starts from a teenager. Like life is terrible. You know, one yeah. I got, you know, I got broken up with, or one bad thing happened. Whatever am I going to do? But yeah. it's, it's funny when we <laughs> zoom out. At, it's so important, man, to zoom out. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's let's zoom back in. You know, I want to talk about all the the documentaries and everything that you're up to today. But but tell me, you know, what what happens? You you go off to University of Florida. Uh, you move on from the kind of tennis. Thing. I mean, from a collegiate standpoint, um, you mentioned you went to law school. Tell me a little bit about kind of those years and how that started to inform your adult life. Yeah. And I think my entrepreneurship is really important through that whole segment too. So yeah. in high school, I started working um, at a custom embroidered hat shop. And then by the time I had graduated from high school, I had a screen printing and embroidery company. And so I didn't like when I moved up to the University of Florida, I didn't move in the dorm because I was running a business. I couldn't run it out of a dorm. So I think my freshman year of college, I did 60 or 70 grand in revenue on my on my t-shirt and embroidery business. And then I got into doing all the Greek story mm-hmm. and fraternity t-shirts. Mm-hmm. And so it was pretty good. It was just really pretty good business. And oh, I started- great. But this is my my college roommate dropped out of college to to do that business. It it, it was a very lucrative business. Yeah. It, it, it is. And so um I did that. And then I I finished undergrad in two and a half years. Um, I walked in with a bunch of AP credits and things like that, AP dual enrollment. I did a, I did a finance degree because I, I didn't know what to study in college. Um, I wanted to be a, I wanted to be the president of a record label, a songwriter and a music producer, like sort of that realm. Um, my parents said, do anything you want. We'll support you, uh, but get a profession. And so I ended up... Um, it's funny. I... I I knew I was going to probably go to law school, especially because I'd finished so early. And I was working on a thing called Gator Girl at the University of Florida, which is known as a, it was the world's largest student run pep rally. And so, like, when I, my final year that I helped run, I brought in Bill Cosby before everyone knew about all this stuff. And like, it's a big mm-hmm. event, the 85,000 people, right? And so I stayed on to do some of that stuff. Um, but I finished undergrad in two and a half years, but I didn't graduate in two and a half because I realized from the moment I graduated, I'd lose all my scholarship money. So I actually mm. went to a professor I'd met in the music college and said, hey, can I do 12 hours of independent study in blues guitar with you for the next semester? And he's like, yeah, so that paid, my scholarship paid for the credits and my additional scholarship paid me back to live. And so mm. I actually didn't graduate early because I could keep more money. Uh, so I graduated after three years instead of two and a half. Um, and then at about a semester before starting law school. In the meantime, I met my wife when I was, I think, 20. Um, and then we got married at... Well, I was dating other... Like, I, my whole life, I was really looking for, like, 
you know, a partner, right? And and my brother said something to me really important in college. And I, I always remember he said, Hey Nick, I realize that you're looking for somebody and that's great. He's like, but you really need to make yourself happy first and then look for someone who makes that better. You can't be looking for somebody who makes you happy. Like that's like that's a burden you can't put on someone else. And it's like, huh. And so that's sort of once I shifted that mindset, like she showed up and I was like, but I'm not ready to be done yet. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. and so I re- I dated some other girls and stuff, and I realized like she was gonna be gone if I didn't, and she was everything I wanted. <laughs> and so we got engaged. We dated for like eight months, got engaged, got married at 22 after my first semester of law school. And so I had a petition. By that time, I had a recording studio in Gainesville with um. A guy named Ronnie Cates, who's a three-time Grammy winner, who's in the band Petra back in the 80s. We produced stuff with uh, Stan Lynch, the drummer from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. We produced Sister Hazel records back then. We produced uh, some Less Than Jake stuff. We had a bunch of people come in. Gainesville is just sort of really neat creative community, sort of far enough north. A lot of people would sort of make their way down. Um, and it was super cool. They were These guys, he owned it with this guy named Dan Dickhouse. And these two guys owned the studio. They built this in this warehouse. It's an amazing recording studio. And I was looking for a place to like sort of set up a shop for my t-shirt business. And I wanted to have a good recording setup because I sort of outgrown it at home. And these guys like did something I'll never forget. They're like, hey, we got we got Studio B. I'm like, where? I don't see. He's like, well, it's 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 our like admin office, but you can share it with Dan where he does all the billing and stuff if you want. And it's right behind the main studio areas, like all the recording areas. They're like, all we got to do is just pack you in through the wall and you'll have access to everything on the other side. I'm like, sounds it's amazing, but what are you going to charge? And they're like, how about $110 a month? I was like, mm. Okay. And so yeah. I learned so much from those guys. But I had, when I started law school, I had, and they liked having me around because they'd ask questions and I'd help with contracts if I could. I was like, hey, I'm just a student, but I'll try. Um, yeah. And they, uh, you know, I had a petition your first year of law school, you're not allowed to work. But I'm like, I run a business. I can't just shut it down for a year. And so, um, so anyway, so I, I petitioned to work and I ran my recording studio. I, I would songwrite. Uh, I I actually got a guy, one of my buddies signed to a record deal my first or second year of law school. And we were doing trips to Nashville. I had some buddies who played football at Auburn. So we would drive from Gainesville, stay the night at Auburn, party, go to Nashville, (laughs) go back to Auburn, party, go back home. We'd do that like three day little trips and we'd go up to write, go up to produce records, do all that stuff. And I, I met some amazing people. I still, I have a songwriting deal in Nashville right now. I write a lot of country and pop. Um, And so music was always like what was driving me. I'm law school. And undergrad, I didn't really, I didn't really want to be at either one for the education. Um, mm-hmm. I did well enough in school. I did well, um, but I just, my whole thing was like, let me just get it over with. I really did want to quit law school. My mom's like, you will really regret it. I promise you, if you quit. Um, mm-hmm. And so I got married after the first semester, and then right in my, right before my last year of law school, my my, I started a business with my business partner right after I got married. He's thirty years older than me. We started that business when I was 22. So we've been in business now, what, 19 years as well. And so I have a lot of long-term relationships, which are helpful for me. Um, Mm -hmm. And so he helped me cut a deal with uh, Cinemark Theaters, if you've ever heard of those, um, to be the CEO of a new division called Cinemark Music. And I was going to develop acts for them. We were going to tour the bands through the theaters on when they were not busy. Um, The theaters had all the audio and screens and stuff. We were going to then sell merch at the, you know, at the, popcorn stands and stuff. We had this whole great plan. I was going to take that gig my last year of law school. Um, They wanted me to move to Orlando because it was closer to one of their theaters. And I did. And then the day, I remember the first day I got here and started doing everything. My wife was a nurse at the time. She was a year older than me and I'd gone on to law school and she helped put me through law school and nursing and, you know, and then she was a nurse and we moved to Orlando. We, We actually bought a house. It was a new construction and sort of a cheaper, newer area. And the first day I showed up, they're like, hey, we got bad news. Cinemark just realized that they didn't think about it really. They didn't tell us at least. They had sold, because it's sort of, we were privately, fun- he, my business partner and another couple partners were privately fun- funding this venture. And uh, they had sold all their preview screen time for like six years to someone else. So we would have to buy it back. And it was like super expensive. It was like, I, this is just not going to work. So like from that moment, I was like, awesome. But I had to move to Orlando. I went to from a public law school. In law school, you can visit your third year, anywhere that's accredited, you can visit and still graduate from your home institution. So I, I went to a private law school, was starting law school that night in Orlando, went from like six grand a year or whatever to like 34, 38,000 a year. And all of a sudden, that's mm-hmm. done. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, what do you think I should do? We had a conversation, but he essentially said, look, you got a year left of law school. Like it, he had other businesses. Like, why don't you come work for me? You can guarantee... 
that you'll have some some income and you you know and, and have stability and then once you get out of law school we can just figure out what you want to do and he was a lawyer too as well mm-hmm. um who didn't really practice law as well so a great mentor and uh mm-hmm. and still is and so i was like all right so i said all right yeah i'll work for you he said well let me tell you the whole story he's like look i i own the business with my nephew you're not going to be working for me you're going to be working for my nephew and really all we need right now is someone in customer service and it pays twenty five thousand dollars a year so i'm like Awesome. So I'm like, I just was going to be, I just was the CEO of this sort of big sounding thing with all this cool stuff and music and all stuff. And now I'm going to go take over a customer service job at a financial software company. All right. He's like, it pays 25 grand. And by the way, you got to work a nine hour shift for the lunch off like everybody else. But I know you got to go to law school. So you can work the eight to five shift with a lunch, an hour off for lunch. So that whole year, Monday through Thursday, I'd leave home go to work from eight to five, go to law school from six to nine, get home at 10 o'clock. I'm supposed to read a hundred pages. Well, I sort of figured out the hacks to not have to read in law school anyway. Um, but just because I was just trying to get through. I didn't mm-hmm. get through. And then the week after I took the bar exam, uh, my wife and I had our first son, Brock, who's 16 now. So like, I all I learned how to grind from a young yeah. age. Like I definitely yeah. learned that and it was helpful. Let me let me ask you, you know, because I, I want to just hear one more thing about the the law school piece. Yep. Because it's really interesting, you know, it's clear your parents had really instilled on in you this professional path. And and, you know, I, I get the kind of wisdom, you know, that would say, well, you know, you're already two years in, you might as well get the diploma, you might as well, you know, take the bar, sit for the bar, you know, become licensed. Um, I get that, you know, once you're that far in, but right. it seems like music, entrepreneurship, like a whole other creative path that includes a whole bunch of stuff outside of uh, being a lawyer right. is really what's drawing you more and more than anything, you know, yet you've got this kind of like, um, professional thing over there that you you are struggling like hell to right. really get across the finish line uh, you know was there any interest in practicing law or what was it was it just the parental conditioning and the kind of might as well finish it thing just can't hurt to have like what was it that got you to do to finish that struggle yeah so uh, there's a couple things that played into that number one um I knew that a lot of people in high up in the music business were lawyers, like a lot of presidents of record labels and a lot of CEOs of big companies, by the way, too. Yeah, I think the, so I knew that it probably would position me, um, that way. I actually went into law school and I remember the very first day of orientation, like what kind of law do you want to practice? I was like, I said, I don't ever want to practice a day of law in my life. I'm just here. I'm here to get the degree and the, and the education. At least I sort of lied about that. I didn't care about the education really either. I was like, where do you get the degree? Uh, and so was, they're like, all right, because you know they do the whole thing. That person won't be there. That person won't be there. Look to your left and right. So they're all assuming I'm the guy who's not going to make it, right? But so so I, I did that. And then also what I will say is really interesting is that um, from the time I started law school, like I mentioned that recording studio, like from the time I started law school, um, I, I got this really interesting bump in credibility that I didn't deserve. Like mm. all of a sudden you went from a college student, which there's no respect for any college students. Like, oh, you're a law student. Mm. And people mm. would start asking me things. They're like, oh yeah, why don't you, why don't you set up shop in the, record, in the recording studio for mm. 110 bucks a month? It's so, like opportunities started coming. And I spent my whole life, I think, um, trying to get a seat at the table. Like being a kid who had ideas. I wanted to run business. I want to do that. And you, you know, you get the, you're too young kid. You're whatever. Mm. It would frustrate the hell out of me. And one time when I was like 15, 16, I put up my first record when I was, uh, when I was 18. Um, and my, a CD and I was, you know, back then, like we had like prodigy maybe, but like the internet wasn't really a thing. And so there's this book called all you need to know about the music business by Donald Passman. The first thing it says is, you know, it teaches you all the royalty structures and stuff. And it's like, but you got to have an entertainment lawyer. So like mm-hmm. I do what you did that. I, I call, I flip open the phone book. I find entertainment lawyers at the time. Orlando was interesting. Cause like it was supposed to be becoming Hollywood West or Hollywood East. Um, you know, Disney built studios over here at MGM and then Universal was building studios. And we actually had Matchbox 20 and Seven Mary 3 and Collective Soul. Like all these bands started sort of coming out of here. And um, I, actually, I don't remember if Collective Soul was here or not, but I know Matchbox and Seven Mary 3. So there actually were a few entertainment lawyers in the phone book. And I called and no one would even take my call because I sounded, you know, like a 
five year old, like, hi, my name is, you know, and, right. and I just remember being so frustrated that I needed something and I couldn't get it. I don't know if I could afford it. There's actually one guy who did take my call and he was Matchbox 20's lawyer. And the funny thing is, like, 20 years later, I ran into him at a Bible study. I'm like, let me tell everybody about this guy for a second. This is the mm-hmm. one man who returned my call. He's a really a good mm. dude. That's but, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But like, a big piece of my life has been like, getting a seat at the table. Yeah. And all of a sudden, when I started going to law school, I was like, hmm. And then when I became a lawyer that didn't practice law, like if I was in a law firm, I would just be the most junior lawyer there. But every mm-hmm. room I was in and marketing and entrepreneurship, they're like, wait, you're a lawyer too? Like it still happens all the time. Like all of a sudden, you're the only lawyer in the room. You get mm-hmm. you get an immense amount of credibility that you, you know, I would say d- doesn't feel earned. Like I remember being like 25 after I was out of law school, work, I worked at my business partner's company for three years and climbed the ranks before he fired me and started a business with me because I'm not meant to be an employee. Uh, but uh, he just... I remember the CEO saying, hey, um, to some man who was like 62, who'd been in business, like this same business for like 40 years, like, oh yeah, you got the contract. Why don't you have Nick review that and he'll get back to mm-hmm. you. I'm like... Mm-hmm. This man knows way more about this business than I do. He probably could write this contract in his sleep, but all of a sudden, oh, give it to the 25-year-old kid because he's a lawyer. And so mm-hmm. I, I, so it was really useful for a positioning tool. And, and a big piece of my business I built over the years now, we have over 3,000 clients in 63 countries in my branding business, has really been dedicated to helping people get a seat at the table because your story is what positions you the way you want it to by you know, articulating the things in your past that have made you the most uniquely situated to help your ideal client. And so, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it, it's, it's become a big part of my story. And I think in a big way, a lot of people give me respect for it because like I went and did it with no intent to practice. And so yeah, it's, it seemed worth continuing. Absolutely. And, and, and I can see how it, it really does give you the seat at the table. And it's an interesting thing, you know, how sometimes credentials can do that. We, um, you know, kind of back to Dan Sullivan, you know, it, he, he's really, you know, big on capabilities over credentials, but there is some value to the credential getting in the room. At the end of the day, you know, you were capable right. of doing a lot of things and that's really why you're successful. Let, let's talk a little bit about what happens. You're, you're you know, now, you know, you, you, you get through the law school part, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of interesting stuff. You're writing songs, you've got the studio, you're a father, um, you know, start to connect the dots a little bit for me as to how you really get to where you are today professionally. Yeah. So I was pr- producing records and get, I got some guys record deals. I got some distribution deals in college and law school where essentially we would like back then it was CDs we'd have a CD that we would get a deal to have in the store. But then we realized like, well, our CD is going to be next to Blink-182 and Metallica. And they've got like, you know, at, to us as college kids, broke college kids, endless budget. And so I learned how to build a team that could execute on things that we could we could stand out and be, you know, and and stack up against those people like in the, in the CD store on the shelf or whatever. And so... I pitched my business partner now at the time of getting involved in entertainment with me. And he, I showed him what I'd done. I'd shot music videos and edited myself. I'd, we couldn't afford a band photo shoot. So I had a friend who was a cartoonist, dramas, cartoons. Uh, and I, and so everything looked pro. And he's like, man, he's like, he's like, Nick, he started the entertainment company with me. But then as all these things started happening and then I went to work with him and all that stuff, he's like, look, if you would do the same thing you did for bands, for entrepreneurs and professionals, he's like, you kill it. You're like building their whole story, all the media they need, all that stuff. And so we end up starting a law firm that the whole point was to be like an agent for a business person. Like we're going to build your story and your credibility. So he had me make that flip. That became very successful. We still in that business today. It was probably done 50 million, probably over that in sales in it. But what happened is along the way, I was still doing my songwriting. I was doing what I had to do and starting the business and you know do whatever you got to do. But I did what any restless creative does. I like I was like, man, now that I'm making money, I want to I want to get back to creative stuff. So I was like, you know, music is just really really difficult. And, and still it it's like a it's like a I don't know. It's like a siren to me. Like I can't pull my eyes away from. It. This is a difficult business to make money in. And so I was like, well, let me try a documentary. So I was hosting, I was a, a, a Grammy voter at the time and I hosted a mastermind, brought some of my clients to the Grammys. 
and I started looking for a story. I started looking into what it'd take to make a documentary, short films. What, what would it be like? I'm not probably not going to win a Grammy. So what would it be like to win an Emmy? So I Googled how to win an Emmy. And it said, <laughs> like, it's got to be great. But like, but here, like, because I remember there's like songwriting contests I had lost before because I just didn't know how to enter it's sort of funny. Like, it's like with grants and things like that. There's a whole industry of people who know how to enter essentially contests. So I was like, let me look into this. So like stories got, you got to have a great story. You got to execute really well, but just starts with a great story. So I started looking for story, found a story, met a guy in the airport. He sent me this thing. His wife wrote Down Syndrome, kid had Down Syndrome, played T-ball. It's called Jacob's Turn, by the way. You can still find it on YouTube. It has over a million views. Um, and I, I went to my mastermind and I said, hey guys, I'm going to take my time and just read you the story. Not a dry in the house. I said, now I want to make a documentary. I'm going to try to win an Emmy. Now I haven't done either of these things before, but if you'll support me, uh, I'll let you go on the journey with me. And so luckily five, six people I think the first thing we did is cost us like 12 or 13 grand. People threw and I made a, you know, a, a, a producer for a thousand bucks or an executive producer for 2,500 bucks. And I had five, six people throw in. I was off. I went and made this documentary. I built a team to do it. Um, we submitted for the Emmys, got two nominations and won one. And I was like, <laughs> All right. So my business partner's like, I, I just got to tell you one thing, Nick. I'm like, what? He's like, you need to do more of that. And I was like, okay. And so I just started building. I started clients and started hiring me to tell their stories. And then I, I really built the system that I still use today of people funding my documentaries um, as as a participant and a, and a supporter, not an investor. I realized removing the monetization from it was the best thing I could do because it's a risky business. Yeah. But if I... You know, I, I would put it this way. I'm going to invite you to a really great steak dinner, not a poker match. Like, you know exactly what you're going to get when you put in money. Yeah. It's no longer like, oh, am I going to double? Am I going to triple? It's like, no, I'm going to give you opportunity to meet famous people and come to premieres and you're going to have your name on the movie forever. Like I did Larry King's life story. And, you know, this, this is a gift from the King family, you know, his tie in suspenders. And I have now like, 10 or 11 clients who for the rest of their life, they executive produce Larry King's life story. And so, yeah. and, and Rudy's, and we started doing, so, um, so I did the first documentary, the other business, the branding business, we still have over the years, I've weaned myself further and further away from running that and just doubling down on uh, entertainment and, uh, and documentary filmmaking and songwriting for the most part. I am developing four scripted narratives right now have been brought in into several different projects with uh, with some pretty big players. We'll see where those go. I've never done them before. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best thing I could say to cap all of this that I think, um, and we can go wherever you want for the last minute or two. So what I realized is what I desired. And Dan Sullivan said, who you're looking for is you. So I was like, how can I serve my clients best? All I really desired in life was a life of joy impact and significance. Like you have to make money to do that yet. But like, I wanted to create an impact. I wanted to be somebody who, who, who gave, and I wanted to be somebody who was looked to when people had an issue or needed something solved. And so I've been able to create a formula for that, that for me, it, um, it you know, it, it came about because I was focused on on entertainment. I wanted to be a voice for positivity and change and inspiring a kid like me that I couldn't afford the Tony Robbins CDs or to go to the seminar. I started building a body of work. That's why I did the Peter Diamandis documentary, the Dan Sullivan documentary, Joe Polish, Jay Abraham, Jack Canfield, Brian Tracy, Lisa Nichols. I wanted to, I wanted to create a roadmap for kids like me or even, or adults too, like to find success. And so that's what I've done. So my manifested entertainment, that's my story. That's not everyone else's story. The formula I'm about to share with you can help can manifest in any realm you want it to. But here's what I realized that if you want to have just be happy, have joy, and and have impact, that means you you provide when you provide impact, it's like yin and yang. You gain significance in return. So it becomes like this beautiful flywheel, right? And so it, there's three things I've realized from working with over 3,000 countries, all uh, clients all across the globe. And then I back tested it on some of the greatest leaders of our time, the Rose, the Parks, the Martin Luther Kings, the Tony Robbins, whoever. And then you got to throw show up with really three things. And it's very simple. Undeniable wisdom. Like when you are wise, you make something complex simple. Like anyone who tries to make something more complex for you, run. That's insecurity for them. And they're trying to pull one over on you. So you got to show up with undeniable wisdom. Like, oh yeah, you need help with that? Here, let me break it down for you. Like for me, you know, branding is simply storytelling. Your brand is your story. A great brand, a story other people want to tell for you. I can't tell people go, 
Oh, thank you. That finally makes sense. Right? So undeniable wisdom. The second one is a true voice. In order to do this, you actually have to know your foundational values really, really well. Because when you show up, decisions become very easy when you understand your foundational values. Like, does it fit or not? And then it's like, do I have time or not? And probably time and where you spend your time should be one of your foundational values. And, and the true voice, I have sort of an acronym for it. It's got to be It's got to be trusted. Like people have to trust you or they're not going to follow you anywhere. Um, it has to be real. It has to be authentically you. Like if I was trying to talk about something that I don't care about, it's not going to come across genuine, right? Um, it has to be unmistakably you. So you know, when you hear a Tony Robbins, you know instantly who it is. It's unmistakable because of the way he talks and because he uses all these things. And then E, it's effortless. Like it, because it's just you being authentically you, it's so effortless. And, and when you do this, you're going to repel some people. Like I talk about my faith. I talk about, I, I don't, I'm not dogmatic about it, but I talk about my faith. I'm going to repel some people, but the rate at which you repel is at least the rate at which you attract, if not stronger. And then, so undeniable wisdom, a true voice. And then the third thing is what makes it look like people who all they do is win, 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 no matter what, you know, that song. But like, it seems like some people like, you know, whether you're a fan of them or not, but we all see the Gary Vaynerchuks and the, and the, uh, Grant Cardone's and right. You just like, God, all these guys do is win. And it's because of this third thing and people just don't really talk about it, but they've built a committed community. They've poured so well into a large number of people through free and inexpensive training and videos and blog posts and social media that it doesn't matter if they want to start a new wine subscription or like a mattress company. There's enough people to help them fund it. And it seems like all they do is win. So I would say what I've learned in my life is that what I desire. So if you are listening to this and you desire a life of joy, impact, and significance, all you have to do is focus on three things. Showing up with undeniable wisdom, speaking in a true voice, and building a committed community. When you do all three of those things, you will have joint impact significance and you'll have a, a group of people that you've served so well that when you show up and serve, opportunity comes to you. And so you've served them so well, you will never run out of opportunities. Mm -hmm. that, that's really, really great. I, I'm just kind of sitting here taking that in and kind of thinking about my own life and kind of what I'm up to. And and I, I couldn't agree with you more on those three things. And, and I really, I want to take um, a little bit of time here to kind of um, just hear more about the documentary work that you're doing. Um, but, but, I, but I'm curious, just one question, follow-up question on those three things. For people listening, how do you think people, or in your case, you went about gaining the undeniable wisdom. I, I mean, I think there's a lot um, tactically to building community. I think there's a lot um, that, you know, might be more self-explanatory about showing up, you know, as your true self. But, but talk about the wisdom piece a little bit. Explain kind of your thoughts on how wisdom works. I, I think wisdom only works really through experience, right? So I was yeah. lucky enough to get a lot of experiences early, like running tennis business and lawn service and t-shirt company. They end up giving to my parents when I graduate from college and going to law school and going to the Grammys and going, you know, just just being surrounding myself. And I'll say this. Um I've gotten so many opportunities because I've always said, how can I serve before I would ever ask for anything? And, and I did it in a non quid pro quo way. Like, Hey, I'm gonna do this for you. Would you do something for me? I always just, you know, learn from my parents really like, Hey, you should just serve people. Well, just be a good human being. And so I've gotten opportunity. And when, when you get to spend, they, you know, they say who you spend, you know, you spend time with nine other people, you become the 10th that have the same characteristics. I've had, I've been blessed with film particularly to interview and work with some of the most brilliant people in the world and, and some of the most famous. And I, I, what I love about what I do is I don't work with celebrities. I work with celebrity experts. I work with people who are famous because they're amazing what they do. They're not just famous because they're Instagram famous. Like they're like I'm doing Dick Vitale's life stories in like 18 Hall of Fames for being a commentator in basketball. And he was a fired NBA coach, but like mm -hmm. he's really, really good at it. And then everyone who I meet doesn't say, Hey, why don't you meet my friend? Who's a deadbeat. They're like, Oh, would you interview Tony Robbins for my movie? I've interviewed Tony three times, been to his house twice. And so mm -hmm. you get to gather wisdom. The other thing I think mm -hmm. people got to understand is that um, the first time you do anything, thank God is going to be the worst time. Like if mm -hmm. you want to get good at something, you have to do a lot of it and you can't skip that process. So like mm -hmm. your first podcast can be way worse than your hundredth. Your first yeah. song you write can be way worse than your hundredth. Your 
first meal you cook, whatever. So like you just got to start. Um, but I've been really blessed to be surrounded by really good people. But the reason, one of the ways I got there was by showing up and being willing to serve, being willing to do anything. And again, I learned that from digging ditches to play at the tennis courts if I had to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one more thing on this subject or, or kind of going back a little bit from something else that you had said. Um, I, I'm really, I love that you highlighted that you Googled how to win an Emmy, right? You, you, you looked it up and, and then like, sure enough, there was a roadmap and you compared it to like grant writing. I, I This is part of the reason I do this podcast is because I think people will hear your bio and they will hear that, you know, you've got sold out Broadway shows and, and 22, uh, uh, you know, Emmys and, and 43 nominations and they'll, they'll make it feel unrelatable. Oh, well, he's an entertainment lawyer and oh, you know, that's so rare and oh, that's not me and I don't have X, Y, and Z. But but there is a roadmap out there for success at a high level. And, you know, you just were willing to kind of uh, investigate it and then you know, kind of take the actions one step at a time. Now, I know it's not that simple and I know it takes tremendous passion and hard work, but it can be done. And, and, and there's a lot of information out there on how to do it, you know, more now than ever. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of circle back around on that point that like, you can do this. It can be done. Yeah. Mentors, knowledge, and grit. Are, and serving people well, maybe four things. Like if you, first of all, find a mentor who's a good person. If you start seeing things that are shady about them, dump them. You don't want to learn. You know, I used to think when I saw someone was really successful and then I started not liking the way they operated, I thought you just had to operate that way to be successful. I learned later, that's not true. So, but I was so young, you know, learn from that and, and from me and walk away from that. Find great mentors, serve people well, and, and just keep learning. I mean, I actually was fooled into, due to the education system, to thinking, I just realized this the other day, I was fooled into thinking that I don't like learning. And it's not true at all. I love learning in an engaging way. Like the reason mm. I do documentaries, I'm learning. I'm constantly getting new inputs and cool new data. And what do I do with that? And how do I, oh, it's fat. I'm, I'm, I'm curious and it's fascinating, but it's in a way that that works for me, that a that, you know, book learning and wrote tests didn't. So um, yeah, be willing to show up and serve and and relationships take you everywhere, right? And so mm -hmm. if you want to mm -hmm. show up and serve people, I mean, I get emails all the time. I get two types of emails. One that basically, whether it says it or not, um, you should really help me, Nick, and you owe it to me. And I don't know who the person is. That, mm -hmm. that person gets deleted because I have plenty mm -hmm. of other things that, like how I would approach someone like, hey, look, even when I approach someone now to do a, to do a film, like, hey, I'm sure you've got lots of people knocking on your door. I'm really intrigued by your story. Um, I, I blah 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 blah. I would love if you had if if you were open to a discussion. I'd love to chat with you about it. If not, no worries. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like a hey, I, I would love to serve you. Would you be open to it? As opposed to like you owe me something. And mm -hmm. so showing up that way gets a lot of opportunity. Yeah, I, I want to kind of land on on um, a couple of things that you've said. Um, and, and I actually think the relationship piece is is kind of similar in that uh, to the education aspect that you mentioned this this idea of of learning. I, I really relate to that because I didn't um, consider myself uh, a learner because I um, didn't do well in school and I wasn't interested in in in, in education the way it was being taught. Right. But I love to learn through documentaries. I love to learn through books today, but certain books, right? I love right. to learn through podcasts and all the, I love to learn from other people by doing the show, from being in networks. And the relationship piece, sometimes I think people hear it as like, oh, I got to go network. Oh, right. I got to go like meet this person because they're going to, right? And and really, it, the, what I wanted to come back to and land on as it pertains to the documentaries is this flywheel that you talked about, right? That when you're loving what you do and you're doing something that's adding value to other people, the all of a sudden, it all gets a lot kind of easier and fun and 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 the 
and the outcomes start to really multiply, right? In an effortless, almost almost effortless flywheel kind of way. And yeah. so um, I've heard you kind of talk about that from a number of different angles. And what I wanted to kind of hear from you as we start to wrap up is the documentaries that you do. I mean, you, you rattled off a bunch of names and and you didn't talk about, you know, the the sex trafficking work that you've done um and and some of the other kind of really powerful projects. You know, you mentioned the power of storytelling. Couldn't agree more. Everybody has a story and there there's so much power in those stories. Talk a little bit about kind of how this flywheel is working for you in the doc side of things and how you continue to learn, grow, and provide value for other people to do the same thing through that lens. Yeah, sure. Uh, and so that flywheel concept, for anybody who doesn't know, is, is a Jim Collins concept uh, from good to great. There's a whole book just about the flywheel. It's short. It's really good. I listen to the audio. Um, you know, with when it comes to the docs, um, I saw that there was just, it's really interesting. There's sort of a hole. There was, I was an entrepreneur before as a filmmaker. And I'm, you know, I believe entrepreneurs provide so much value in the world. But really, other than a few, you know, Richard Branson and Mark Cuban and some of the sharks, you know, Damon John, like the world isn't really celebrating entrepreneurs. I was like, man, there's so much to be learned from these people. And it was also, sort of an untapped resource. I mean, all these guys had books, but no one was making documentaries on these guys. So it was one of the ways I got started there. And I think, you know, it's a Dan Sullivan concept of unique ability. I've really been able to work through, like, what is my unique ability? And my unique ability is having impactful conversations that lead to produced outcomes. Like, that's literally what it is. So if you ask me to go on a podcast, done. You ask me to speak in an event, done. I do it in front of the camera as a host. I have a conversation, and then it gets produced into an episode. Do it behind the camera, have a great conversation, turns into a documentary. But I stay in my lane too. Like I, like I would kill myself if I had to edit stuff. I can't shoot nearly as well as the guys. Like I think a lot of people have a problem with control. Like I don't want it all. I'm like, no, man, I'm just going to stay out of the way. Like I was working with a guy who toured with John Mellencamp for 20 years and with James Taylor and all. He, he scored a movie for me. He's like, man, he's like, you're having me take notes. Someone else is giving me notes. I've never worked with a director does that. I'm like, you know what? I've never done this this way before. And this person does it every day and I trust them. So if I see a problem, I'll let you know, but like, I'm just going to stay out the way. And so mm-hmm. I just stay in my unique ability. And so I've been able to do that with docs. And of course, one's led to another's led to another's led to another. And certainly, you know, the world of human trafficking, my eyes were opened hugely to that. Um, we got my bulletproof vest there from our, our shoot in Haiti. I actually got another shoot coming up in Haiti. We've now tra- covered trafficking in Haiti, Colombia, Iraq. And my newest film is about to come out on trafficking in America and it's how it's happening digitally. And, and it's, people aren't missing. Um, kids are getting extorted in their own bedrooms on their digital devices because they've typically made a foolish mistake because someone was a professional duped them in to sending a nude picture or whatever it was. And uh, so how it's really, there's a there's an epidemic here uh, in America and all across the globe and how it's happening. So super passionate about that. Uh, and then I'm, you know, doing some sports stuff. I'm doing Chris Voss's documentary right now. Uh, you know, the author of Never Split the Difference, former FBI hostage negotiator. Really, I have tacked most of my docs in, um, in, in th- sort of three three categories. Mentor mine, Dr. Nito Cobain, he says, a life well lived is a life lived in thirds. One third earning, one third learning, one third serving. And I I love, I could not ever articulate as well as he did, but I, I try to live that way. So when I look at docs and where I'm going with them, I try to I try to sort of keep that balance, like for the viewer and for me, like, will this help me earn more? So am I learning more or can I serve by sharing the story of trafficking or or orphanages or or whatever it is? Yeah. Amazing. I love it. And and it's it's really uh Making a difference. I mean, you know, you can learn in in from all of those stories, and uh, I mean, like that Chris Voss story will be incredible, and what you just shared about kind of the complexity of sex trafficking and how it's being done digitally. I mean, these are these are stories that are coming into our homes that are not like foreign, right? I mean, you are really shining a light on some serious stuff. It is an epidemic. And whether it be that or, you know, some of the more fun stuff, you know, the sports stuff. I mean, there's a ton to learn. I, I just uh, think it's really great. It, it really is serving. You know, what, what's kind of uh, really cool is how you've been able to take those three things and and make them one. And um, 
I just think it's great. And I appreciate you taking time today to join me and to share your story. Um, you're mostly on the other side of the microphone and mostly on the other side of telling stories, but it's great to have a chance to hear yours. And uh, any kind of final thoughts? I mean, I think, you know, look, uh, you can you can achieve uh, anything you want in life, just helping enough other people. You know, someone smarter than me said that, but uh, I just highly encourage it. If you don't know what to do next, or if you're ever stuck or you're frozen or depressed, go out and serve somebody, man. You'll be blown away by the opportunity that shows up and, and how it makes, how it will shift, shift the trajectory of what's happening in your life. Awesome. Nick Nanton, that's a wrap. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me.